Okay, Caesar is dead. He's been murdered. We've discussed that in class. Um, what comes next? Well, it certainly doesn't uh, set off a period of peace, at least. Prosperity's there, but there's no peace. So we're looking at a map of the Roman Empire right around the death of Caesar. Okay, you can see that it's a fairly sizable chunk of territory um, surrounding almost all of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, it's been acquired in slow pieces, but it's a very sizable chunk of territory, and it's going to take somebody who knows what they're doing to run it. So here's what happens. Um, it leads to chaos and more civil war. Caesar had left all of his duties to his heir, Octavian, who was his grandnephew, the son of his sister. Um, Octavian combines with Mark Antony, who was Caesar's number one general, and another man named Lepidus. Um, and they go after, they form a triumvirate similar to Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, and they go after Caesar's enemies, defeat them in battle, finally, um, Brutus and Cassius, um, at a place called Philippi over in Macedonia in northern Greece. They split the empire up. Octavian takes control of Rome, and in the west he has Spain and Gaul and um, the parts of all of Italy and um, the parts along the Adriatic Sea down into Greece. Mark Antony takes the east, he has Egypt, he has um, what we call the Middle East, uh, what is now modern day Syria, Israel, Jordan, and he takes Turkey. And then Lepidus gets what's left, he gets the parts of North Africa that are really co not, in, not consequential, other than they are the suppliers of grain to the rest of the empire. Okay, Octavian is very smart, he's a very capable ruler, and we're going to see more about that in class. Um, Mark Antony, not so much. He makes some bad decisions, he makes some bad alliances that cause problems. And he ignores the dictates of the Senate and Octavian um, for what he's supposed to be doing. He uh, forms an alliance or a relationship with Cleopatra. They have some children. Um, he divorces Octavian's sister, Octavia. Always not a good idea to you know, tick off your rival. Um, Rome says he's going native. He's turning, he's no longer a Roman. Um, and he also suggests that Caesarian, the child that Cleopatra had by Caesar, is actually the legal and rightful heir of Caesar, of Julius Caesar. Octavian takes umbrage of that, so they go to war. 32 BCE, Octavian's forces attack Egypt. 31 BC, they fight the Battle of Actium, which I'll show you a map in a second. Um, that is up on the coast of Greece. Mark Antony and Cleopatra's feet, fleet is destroyed. A year later, Mark Antony realizes that all is lost. He commits suicide, and Cleopatra follows him shortly by committing suicide. Okay, so here's the Battle of Actium. And you can see here that um, Octavian's fleet over here in the green kind of gets to the outside and bottles up Antony's fleet here in the harbor at Actium, and they're able to chop them up and destroy because they have no way of escaping. And this is over on the coast of Greece, okay? Um, painting of Antony and Cleopatra, they're one of the great love affairs of history, um, basically brought both of them to ruin. Okay, that brings us to the age of Augustus. Okay, you're going to need to continue watching this video, taking notes on it, and there are some questions embedded in. The previous part is stuff we may have gotten to in class, but just in case we did it, I added it to the video. So this is a statue of Augustus here in the center of the page. Again, he's Caesar's grandnephew. Um, when he comes to power in 44, he's 18. So by the time he defeats um, Cleopatra and Antony, he is right around 30 years old. Okay. So what you're going to need to answer by watching this video and at the end is you need to explain to me what the Pax Romana was and how did Augustus go about bringing it about. We'll be talking more about that in class um, tomorrow. So again, Caesar's the grand, or Octavian is the grandnephew of Caesar. He's later called Augustus. He becomes ruler on Caesar's death. Um, after fighting the war against Antony and Cleopatra, he, gets, he gains absolute power and brings the Republic to an end. The period of the Roman Empire has begun. And it begins with a 200-year peace called the Pax Romana or Roman Peace. Pax Romana is simply um, Italian or Latin for Roman peace. During this time, the Roman Empire spread stability over a large area of the world, including parts of Europe, 
North Africa, and Southwest Asia. They conquer all the way up into Britain, um, all the way to the Rhine and Danube rivers. In a few places, they cross the Danube. They conquer Romania. They conquer all of modern-day Turkey, um, most of the Middle East, into the areas of what are called Iraq and all of North Africa, and a fair ways down the Nile. Uh, Augustus builds a very um, complex system of roads and coins money that will be used throughout the empire. So similar to Shi Wangdi, he standardizes things and makes communication and um, transportation much easier. He also goes on kind of a building spree. He builds a lot of uh, buildings in Rome and sets up a civil service system in Rome for people to work in the government. Never actually takes the title of emperor. Okay, Um, he prefers to be called first citizen. He's a first among equals Um, kind of it's 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 oftentimes something that's been done in the ancient world and sometimes in the modern world where someone will have all the power, but never actually take the title. So the Pax Romana, what was it? 27 BCE to 180 BCE or CE. So roughly 207 years. It's a period of peace and stability in the empire. It's really Rome's golden age. Okay. Roman government is departmentalized. On the top, you have Caesar or the emperor. You have the Senate, which is no longer the main source of power, though Octavian uh, Augustus actually tries to keep up the charade. You have more power going out to the governors of the different provinces as the empire grows bigger. You have a strong military organized into the legions. They're all separate from each other, but they all report to Caesar. It's very set up, very similar to the United States with the cabinet structure, um, except for you have the Senate, which is kind of the legislative piece, where the legislative piece in the U.S. is um, a separate entity. Okay. Forts are built along the frontier to protect the empire against evasion. Probably the most famous of these is what's called Hadrian's Wall. It's a wall that's built across the center of of Great Britain from uh, the North Sea on one side to the Irish Sea on the other. Um, It is still there. You can still see it. This is what the ruins look like. It was basically the the Romans realized that they were never going to conquer the Celts and the Scots of the northern parts of Britain. though They were just too wild and the the climate was too terrible. So they built this wall to keep those people out and it became kind of the, 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 the end point of the empire, at least at that point. Ireland is never conquered. Uh, Scotland is never conquered. Okay. Rome divides its empire uh, into provinces run by a man called the procurator or governor. An example would be the guy in the Bible who suppo- who's supposed to have put Jesus to death, uh, Pontius Pilate in, the, in the, the territory of Judea. And Rome becomes interdependent, interdependent on the other parts of the Mediterranean for scarce resources. Okay, um, and we're talking the city of Rome. Okay, we had they get grain from Africa, um, precious metals from the Middle East, um, fish and things from the the Greeks and from the islands. Every part of the empire contributes to Greece. Spain is kind of the breadbasket, and France, where they grow a lot of crops, and everything is sent to Rome. Rome becomes the center of the empire, and the saying "All roads lead to Rome." Rome or led to Rome, um, it comes into vogue. Rome is also called the, the Eternal City or the City of the Seven Hills. Trade flourishes throughout the empire. The Mediterranean is really turned into a Roman lake um, because the Romans control the entire environs of the Mediterranean, so they control all the trade. Their navy keeps the peace. Um, and everything goes well, especially for those first two years. You have a period of what they call the five good emperors. There's others in there, but there's five famous emperors. We'll talk about some of them as we go along um, through those first things, the last of which is a guy named Marcus Aurelius, who is the emperor who is killed at the very beginning of the Gladiator movie. Rome becomes an international city. There's people from all over the place living there, over a million inhabitants, which is huge by ancient standards. It is the largest city in the world, um, at least from the archaeological evidence that can be found at this point. Okay, Goals of the empire, they want peace, obviously, domestic tranquility. You don't want rebellions within there. You've just had probably 15, 20 years of civil war, so you want to get out of that. You want stability in the provinces so that they can collect taxes and grow the crops and things that Rome needs to send down there. Um, One of the ways they accomplish this is they grant citizenship to all conquered people, obviously following the same rules of Roman citizenship with property restrictions and men only. They give provinces autonomy or local rule. They allow the local governor to pretty much run things as long as 
the tax revenue and everything else is running the way it's supposed to. Okay, so class tomorrow, you need to be able to answer this question. What was the Pax Romana? And how did Augustus bring it out? That will be your bell ringer in class. That's all for now. We will pick up with Christianity on Monday.